Good evening. My name is Selena Joffrey, and I'm the Director of Business and Policy at Asia Society Texas Center. Tonight's program is on educational equity and the evolution of the classroom in the COVID era. As schools begin reopening, there are many unanswered questions about how safe it is to congregate students back onto school campuses, which has led to many school districts transitioning to online instruction. But virtual classrooms present their own challenges, including unequal access to internet and technology and complications for working parents. Educators may also fa face difficulties in designing successful digital classes, while students can struggle to adapt to remote learning and miss the benefits of social interaction. To address some of these topics, we have a very special guest with us this evening that I'm extremely honored to introduce. Sal Khan is a pioneer of online education. He's the founder and CEO of Khan Academy, whose mission is to provide a free, world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Khan Academy offers lessons in math, history, grammar, physics, biology, and many more subjects. Today, more than 100 million registered users access Khan Academy in 43 languages in more than 190 countries. Sal has been profiled by 60 Minutes, featured on the cover of Forbes, and recognized as one of Time's 100 most influential people in the world. We're honored and very grateful to have him with us this evening. Our moderator is Laura Arnold, co-chair of Arnold Ventures. The philanthropy's core mission is to invest in evidence-based solutions that maximize opportunity and minimize injustice. Laura serves on the Stanford PAX Advisory Board and is a founding partner of the Reform Alliance. Before we get started, I would like to share that Asia Society is an educational institution promoting cross-cultural understanding for a more inclusive world. Because we believe in the importance of having access to diverse communities and perspectives, many of Asia Society's programs like this one are free. Please consider supporting our work through a tax deductible gift by texting Asia Society TX to 243-725. We hope you enjoy the program. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's um, an honor to be here. I'm Laura Arnold. Thank you, Selena, for uh, that wonderful introduction. And, um, and thank you, Sal, for being with us this evening. Uh, I, I was kidding earlier today that I think the two most uh, in-demand speakers these days are Dr. Fauci and Sal Khan. So, you know, we are thrilled that you are, are spending a little bit of time with us uh, today because I can only imagine uh, the demands on your time given the, the moment that we're living in. Uh, I was also reflecting, you know, on the fact that we can all point to really interesting people kind of in our lives or people that we read about. Um, we can point to lots of innovators. We can point to uh, people who've had enormous success and really have had breakthroughs in, um, in the way that have affected the way we live. Um, everything from the internet to Amazon to, you know, to electric cars and, um, and the list goes on. What I think is really special about you, Sal, is that Unlike most of those other examples, you've done it in service of a nonprofit. So you've done it for humanity, uh, not necessarily for yourself. Uh, so I just wanna kick off by saying that I think that is uh, an incredibly admirable uh, thing that, that we're all so grateful for. Well, no, thank you for that. And, uh, but you know, I consider myself incredibly fortunate that I get to work on this, on this mission. So I guess it's a win-win. Yeah, well, no, it's, it, and it's great. And I wish, uh, 
I wish we had more than just 40 minutes together uh, because I have so many questions for you from, you know, everything from how you started it to what makes you tick and all these things. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to delve into that. And I, and I want to dive into the issues of educational equity. I do want to tell the, the audience, everybody who's watching, that um, you did a terrific interview with Guy Raz on how I built this uh, not too long ago. So uh, that is on uh, on the web as a podcast. Uh, anybody who wants the uh, more unedited version of uh, of Khan Academy, I encourage you to uh, to take a listen to that podcast. I enjoyed it very much, and um, I always learn something when I when I hear an interview of yours. So. Um, so as much as I would love to, you know, to hear every uh, every aspect of how you got started, uh, I do want to spend this time together uh, talking about what uh, what's on everybody's mind in terms of uh, educational equity and what uh, what it means to to use online resources in the way that we do. Uh, but before we do that, it, uh, it, it seems appropriate to start a conversation of educational equity with your own experience. Uh, which many people don't know about. I'd love for you to talk about your background. You yourself are, uh, you know, a uh, a success story of educational opportunity. So talk to us about where you came from and how you grew up and how you wound up where you are. Yeah, and as you know, I could easily take up forty minutes on that. So I'll give the I'll yeah. give the bullet point. I'll give the bullet yeah. point versions of it. But yeah, I, I actually grew up not too far from Houston. I was born and raised in Metairie, Louisiana, essentially you know Greater New Orleans. We used to go to Houston back in the day. That was our road trip to go visit the Galleria, which was a big deal for us. We had never seen them all that big, uh, and and uh, you, you know. My story is actually in some ways parallels a lot of South Asian folks who were born in the in the mid 70s. Uh, but I think it took some kind of divergent paths that are, are, are probably less stereotypical for a lot of South Asians at that time. You know, my father originally came. Uh, it was the Immigration Act of 1965 where we had a shortage of healthcare workers. And that was the first time that the U.S. started to have really a, a more significant immigration from South Asia. And my father came to do his residency at uh, LSU New Orleans at, at Charity Hospital. That was in, back in 1968. He goes back to what was becoming Bangladesh in 1971 uh, and marries and find, you know, is an arranged marriage, marries my mother, come back to New Orleans, you know, 72, they have uh, 73, they have my sister, 76, uh, I'm born. And then my, my parents separate, which was very kind of non-traditional for especially South Asian families, especially in the 70s. And, uh, you know, my father, obviously highly educated, but he had, you know, multiple things he was dealing with. And so he leaves and, you know, moves to Philadelphia. And I actually never really meet him. And he, you know, and he passed away short, not a little while after that. And so I was raised by a single, a single mother, um, you know, who just come from uh, Bangladesh. Or actually, she was raised most of her life in India. Um, and, and was trying to make ends meet. And, you know, so we'd kind of fallen into this world of, you know, my mom was the lady and I, I talk about in that Guy Raz interview that you talk about, you know, she was doing odd jobs. She was working as a cashier over time. She saved up enough money that uh, she was able to, you know, get together a little convenience store uh, in, in Metairie. Uh, but, you know, for the, the what I consider myself very lucky is that I had a sister who was an overachiever who was three years older than me. And because of her, there was always a lot of faith and confidence, even when I was, frankly, not that impressive of a student uh, in elementary school. Uh, but slowly but surely, and I give a lot of credit to the Jefferson Parish School System, which is Metairie, Louisiana. It's not some world famous school system, but it is a school system that, you know, I have many memories of kindergarten, first, second grade, where a teacher took me aside and showed that they really believed in me. Uh, and that gave me the confidence to become a, a you know, a, a better and better a student and to have bigger and bigger aspirations. And so, you know, you fast forward, I, by the time I was in high school, I got pretty serious about, you know, wanting to do things and, and explore the world and becoming a scientist or engineer or something. And, you know, that's where I, I, I remember I applied to MIT and, you know, my, my high school grade skiing, it wasn't exactly a feeder school <laughs> to, to MIT, uh, but that was kind of the beginning. And, you know, ever since then, you know, my original background was math and, and in computer science, uh, but then, you know, I ended up going to business school and becoming a hedge fund analyst, but that's kind of when I started falling into education with tutoring family members. Right now you, uh, so you get to MIT, you, uh, you wind up afterwards at Harvard Business School and you end up at this hedge fund, which is um, success in the definition of, you know, of 
many people, right? You're making, you're making good money. We love hedge funds. Hedge funds are great. Um, and suddenly you, 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 you start tutoring a family member, you become more and more passionate and interested about this. Talk to us about that moment. What drove you to make that tectonic shift really from, you know, from, you know, it, it's, it's drastic, right? From totally private sector, you know, profit maximizing to, uh, to profit maximizing in every other respect, uh, except for money. Yeah. You know, and, and people, you know, hedge funds and you know, you know it well, and I know it well, I used to work in the industry, you know, it really is just an investment management with, with, with more flexibility. And, you know, I found that job fascinating because I'm, I consider myself a very curious person and I was able to spend my days, you know, understanding, you know, oil prices and then retail and then tech all in one day. And so it was a very interesting way to understand the world. So I, I was really enjoying it as kind of a, curious nerd about the world. Uh, but while that was happening, this was 2004, I was a year out of business school. I was living in Boston at the time. My family from New Orleans was visiting. It was right after my wedding. And it just came out of conversation that my 12-year-old cousin Nadia was, was having trouble with school, especially in math. And I was 100% sure that she was capable of learning math. It's just that she had lost self-confidence. Maybe she had some gaps. And in the back of my mind, not only did I feel like I could help her, uh, but I had always dreamt that you know, I, as much as I enjoyed the hedge fund job, one of my real dreams was if I could do this long enough, maybe one day I could start a school and maybe kind of retire as a, something of a Dumbledore type figure. I always imagined that to be the best possible way to to live, you know, to be, uh, be in retirement, so to speak, or a second phase of your career. And so mm -hmm. when my cousins needed help, I was like, well, maybe I could start exploring this pat this other passion I have. And, you know, long story short, I, I started working with Nadia. She slowly, actually, the first part was just deprogramming her lack of self-esteem. She got caught up with her class. Uh, then she got a little ahead of her class, as I have often described. I then became a tiger cousin. I called up her school, said, you know, I really think Nadia Rahman should be able to retake that placement exam from last year. They said, who are you? I said, I'm her cousin. And, and then they let her. And, uh, you know, the same Nadia who was put into a slower track was then put into an advanced track. And actually, this is the same Nadia who in seventh grade, thought that she couldn't learn unit conversion by that summer was taking pre-calculus at the University of New Orleans. And so I was pretty hooked. I started tutoring her younger brothers. The fund I was working for, a very small fund, my boss's name was Dan Wool. Uh, his wife, Allison, becomes a professor at Stanford. So we moved the firm, so to speak. It was just really me and Dan at the time uh, to Northern California. Uh, but more relevant to, to how I got into this is that word spreads in my family that free tutoring is going on. And i find myself with 10, 15 cousins, family, friends every day. And, and I was willing to put the time into it because I felt like I was onto something. I saw that if, if I could help my cousins fill in their gaps, kind of deprogram their lack of confidence, that almost all of them, pretty much all of them could become really great at math and science, these things that they thought were, was, were beyond them. And with a background in software, I was always intrigued by maybe I can make some tools for them that will make my life tutoring them easier, but could, if it works, could scale one day, and it was a little delusional back then, maybe we'll scale one day to millions and millions of folks. And, you know, the first things I made was software, had nothing to do with videos, but a lot of folks were using it. My cousins found benefit. And then I, the first video was actually a friend suggested I made, make that to help scale my lessons. I thought it was a horrible idea at first. I thought it was, you know, YouTube for cats playing piano, dogs on skateboards, whatever else, but I gave it a shot. And once again, my cousins found it useful and people who weren't my cousins started finding it useful. And but it was, it was a long process. You know, some people say, oh, hedge fund analyst quits his job, starts Khan Academy, and, you know, the world is as it is. There was about five years from when I started tutoring Nadia to when I seriously said, hey, look, as much as I like my hedge fund job, and it was it was good on multiple levels, I had a great boss, had I was getting paid well, et cetera, et cetera, this other passion started to take over a lot of my mind share. And so, uh, you know, over that five years, I started more and more seriously considering it, sitting down with my wife, looking at our finances. And by you know 2009, it felt like there was just, something was happening here. Some, there felt to be some momentum. There's about 50,000 people, 100,000 people who are using these resources. And I said, surely if I devote myself fully to this as set it up as a not-for-profit, that kind of the universe would conspire to, to, to resource this and to make this a real thing. And you know, whenever you take- That one actually of these did happen. It, well, it, and even that yeah. took longer than expected. Whenever right. you take, a, you know, anyone who's tried to start anything for profit, nonprofit, yeah. you always have to start with that kind of delusional optimism, like surely the world will conspire to, to support this, but it takes a little time. So it was a tough year, 2009 and early 2010, but it eventually it did happen. And we were able yeah. to become a real organization. 
Yeah, and, and, and of course you scaled, you had some uh, incredible philanthropists who stepped in and believed in you at the, uh, at the early start, uh, including Andorra, Bill Gates, uh, who really sort of launched you and into, into this path that you've, um, that, that you've now built uh, and into the COD Academy that we have before us, which has uh, over a hundred million users and uh, that serves pre-K through high school uh, that has, you know, millions and millions of registered learners and, um, you know, a, a, a gigantic scope. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, Sal, you know, you mentioned, uh, obviously they started with tutoring and I should mention, by the way, that um, we are, we are big fans of Khan Academy. I can't tell you how many times our kids say, well, why didn't you just explain it the way he did? Like, I get it when he said it. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about, but, you know, he's, him I get. So, um, so obviously you, you know, you have a secret sauce that has been very successful. Um, but thinking about educational equity, one of the, uh, one of the main um, observations and, and some might call it a criticism of online education that, um, that we hear is that uh, what we often see is what was called the Matthew effect from, you know, a verse in the book of Matthew that essentially says the rich get richer that these resources uh, really benefit kids who are wealthy, uh, kids who have the infrastructure, kids who are already successful. So supplementary materials uh, really are skyrocketing uh, the success of kids who are already either on the verge of success or successful, and therefore are uh, really, really accentuating the divide, exacerbating the problem as opposed to contributing to the solution. Uh, I'm curious how you'd respond to that and what your experience has been now, you know, more than 10 years in, uh, as you've really gravitated uh, from a, an, uh, you know, a supplementary tool to experimenting with using this as, um, as, as something more. Yeah, and that's 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 an incredible question, uh, and something we keep close tabs on because at the end of the day, is a not for profit with a mission of free world class education for anyone anywhere. The last thing you would want to do is somehow increase inequity. Um, and the way the way I think about it, uh, because you know we're we're the official practice partner for the SAT, and you know there was some there was a, a study that was done and even a book that was written about. Uh, showing that the proportion of the folks using the SAT, that's still a, a reasonably large proportion, I think it was 50% or 60%, were students from upper middle class families. And so this could say, hey, maybe this is having that exact same effect. But the way we think about it is what happens when you have the resource or when the resource is taken away? So if, if, if you while you have the resource, yes, you know, and we want to be a world-class resource. So that's actually a good signal that even, even families that could afford other options are using it. That is a signal that even though this is free, this is actually probably the best thing for them to use. And then you still have a large number of students who are using it, who wouldn't have been able to afford it before, who would not have had access. If these types of resources are taken away, the, so to speak, the, the haves will still find options. They'll still have resources. Maybe they'll do paid tutoring, et cetera, et cetera, while you now have a large chunk of the population that will not. And it actually would be a bad sign if the, the haves weren't using it, because then that would be a sign that it isn't truly world-class. You know, I'll give an example of, you know, the library system or um, museums is, is a similar one that, uh, you know, many of us find it, you know, and, and we we're in the middle class or upper middle class or fluent, and we're able to take our kids to libraries, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's all great. Uh, and you might say, well, well, does that hurt the divide? But when you, when you get reminded of what would happen if the libraries disappeared, then you realize that, okay, yeah, if the libraries disappeared, all of us, we would still find ways to get our kids books. Um, or if the parks disappeared, we would still find ways for our kids and all of us to find open space, or, you know, in our own backyards or wherever it might be. While if these things disappeared, then the underserved kids will not have these things. They will not have access to books. They will not have access to, you know, positive academic experiences to, to outdoor space, if you think about the parks. So, so that's, you know, the first layer that we think about it. The other layer we think about it is, you know, it's not enough just to kind of cop out and settle on that argument I just made. The other aspect is to proactively make sure that we're reaching students where they, where they are and what, the, what they need. And I actually think there's two dimensions to it. You know, we could talk about socioeconomic. I think there might also be another dimension around what you can only loosely call as motivational. And, you know, motivation, whatever, I don't know how you quantify it, but I think that actually transcends socioeconomics. And some of these online tools are actually very compelling for 
kids that are already somewhat activated, some of them who could be very, very poor. You know, there's stories. There's a young girl in, Z uh, in Mongolia who at age 16 was an orphan, uses Khan Academy, is now our number one creator of content for Khan Academy in Mongolia. And there's a young girl in, in Afghanistan at age 13, the Taliban keep her from going to school, but she's able to use Khan Academy to keep up you know, her name is Sultana. She eventually, I, I eventually met her and she told me that she realized it was really valuable when she was learning more than her brothers in the Taliban controlled school, which, you know, isn't really a high bar, but she kept going. And, and, you know, that young woman, she smuggled herself into Pakistan to take the SAT and then she got political asylum. And last I checked on her, she was doing quantum computing research at Caltech. So those are examples of people who are marginalized and, and arguably poor uh, who, because of incredible motivation, are able to use these online tools to do far better than most uh, folks, even folks with the resources. And so what, we, what we're trying to do at Khan Academy is how can we make the platform more approachable, more engaging, so that the motivational threshold to use it becomes something that is far more and more achievable for more and more students and families. And also, uh, you know, you mentioned we started off very much as this, we put it out there and people use it on their own. And it was from the beginning, teachers did use it. You know, we have 200,000 teachers, over 200,000 who over the years have been using Khan Academy in some way, shape or form in their classroom. But we realized if we really want to reach the kids who need it most, we have to more systemically integrate with districts and, and especially high need districts uh, with, you know, majority minority populations or majority underserved populations. And so this has been a big part of our strategy over the last four or five years. And, you know, I just saw some data today that, you know, in terms of Khan Academy usage, our usage uh, in free and reduced lunch or Title I school majority lunch, uh, free and reduced majority lunch, free and reduced lunch majority schools is slightly higher than the national average. Our, the proportion of the students using us in classrooms who are Latinx is a higher percentage than the national average. Uh, the, the serving black students is a higher percentage than the national average. So these are the data points that we're looking at to, to hold ourselves accountable to make sure that you know, it's great if everyone's children, you know, we want everyone's children to say, hey, this is the best thing available, but we especially want to make sure that underserved kids, low income kids um, know this is for them and that we can really move the dial for them. Yeah. Now, one, uh, I think, uh, extremely important and um, uh, meaningful piece of the Khan Academy platform is the idea of mastery. Right, which is uh, sadly sort of absent from a lot of um, of conventional education. This idea that you don't, uh, you know, if you didn't learn fractions, uh, you know, by October, you don't get to go to, you know, to whatever else. You know, you need to master, uh, you know, master the levels before you proceed. Uh, and if you get a C in fractions, then you're not ready to go to the next to the next thing. You should, you know, you should build your uh, uh, build your mastery of that subject. So. Uh, I'm curious as to how you think uh, that that has has manifested in underprivileged schools to the extent you've seen um, you've seen partnerships. You've done a lot of uh, a lot of partnerships with school districts uh, on on this very issue on flipped classrooms and trying to you know trying to 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 create an environment where kids go at their own pace. Uh, how what what has been your learning from those experiences, which you've now had for several years? Yeah, and this this really kind of gets to the the, the core of of what we believe at Khan Academy, and since then have now have a lot of evidence behind it. You know, I saw this in the well, I actually saw this even before I was tutoring my cousins. You know, back when I was a in high school, it might not surprise anyone that I was the captain of the math team and the math honor society. <laughs> well, all the cool you kids. Know, are okay, we had similar yeah. maybe maybe high yeah. school years. Uh, yeah. But one of the things we did in in this in the math club, so to speak, is we ran tutoring of of our peers. Uh, and what I saw repeatedly is, you know, a lot of my 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 friends in high school who were failing math even and thought they were no good if they just, one, learned a little bit intuitively, more importantly, had a chance to fill in gaps from previous years, they were they were almost like, oh, this is all that need, this is all that meant? Wait, I had a problem with decimals? That's why I couldn't understand the algebra? And I remember seeing that in high school. I remember seeing that even when I went to college, that the reason why people might have trouble with some of those intro, oftentimes weeder courses in STEM, had nothing to do with those courses being hard. It's because those courses assume that you have strong foundations in calculus and trigonometry and, and other things. And then I saw it again with my cousins. You know, Nadia just had some core gaps and it wasn't even seventh grade gaps. It was fourth and fifth grade gaps. And it didn't take much effort as long as we identified it 
to fill in those gaps. And then she was off to the races. And so from those early days, when I wrote that fee- that first software, which was the first Khan Academy, I just said, hey, I need to give my cousins, I had this thing called the knowledge map that would start at one plus one equals two and give as much practice as necessary. And then it will do two digit addition. Then it'll do single digit subtraction. And it would work all its way up to all the way up to algebra and trigonometry. And obviously now Khan Academy goes well beyond that. But I would tell all my cousins, even the ones that were in ninth or 10th grade, start at the beginning. Cause I wanna make sure that you have all of your gaps filled in. And almost all of them thought, wait, you're gonna make me go to kindergarten level math. But they almost, after doing it for a couple of weeks, almost all of them said, oh, I did, you know, I realized I didn't fully understand, you know, whatever, adding fractions with unlike denominators, or what does it mean to divide a fraction or negative exponents or whatever. And when you fill in those gaps, you see students are, are then off to the races. And, it, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm just, I, I was going to ask, in your experience, does that happen in practice? When you've made, uh, when you've had partnerships in Compton and Long Beach and, uh, you, you had a partnership here in Houston, have a partnership here in Houston, which was interrupted, of course, by COVID. So we don't have uh, very much data. But does that in schools that are so under-resourced, where, uh, where administrators and teachers are dealing with sort of basic needs from food to housing to violence and everything else, um, in your experience, is that approach successful? Is it even implemented? Yeah. So I think this is the ultimate question. So the first thing is, if you're not, you know, I think especially in these environments, if you have a, if you have one bad month, especially in something like mathematics, that's so cumulative, especially if it's early on in your mathematical career, it's when you're covering, as you mentioned, fractions, that one bad month is going to stay with you the rest of your life. There's no way you're going to be able to master algebra or whatever else when you get to it. And frankly, the data is clear in the US, 70% of all kids who go to community college have to take remedial math, which is a euphemism for sixth or seventh grade math. Mm-hmm. And those kids who get placed there, it's called the intellectual graveyard, especially for underrepresented students. They never take credit bearing courses, even college algebra is a struggle, but it's not because they're not bright, it's because they they have these gaps. And you can imagine if you're, if you're growing up in a tough environment, an under-resourced environment, maybe you're moving around, living on folks' couches, you know, something's going on at home. It's very easy to have a month or a year where things are not great and you, you, you accumulate major gaps. And so that's why I strongly believe uh, that so many kids in these communities start having str- trouble, why 70% of these students, and these are the ones that graduate and, and want to do the right thing, have to do things like take, take remedial math. Now, in terms of whether, you know, when we go into a district, and we do partnerships, are we seeing the mastery learning happen? And the, the simple answer is yes, but uh, the, the yes is there's always pockets where teachers are implementing it really, really well, uh, where they are, you know, we just launched during COVID these get ready for grade level courses, which do all the prerequisites up to the grade level course. And then students and teachers can evaluate where students are in those get ready for grade level courses. If they get a 90% on our course challenge, then they're ready for grade level. But if they get a 40 or 50%, that means those kids need, they need some foundations to fill in. And so the classrooms where the teachers are either front loading the year saying, hey, get do the get ready for grade level course ahead of time. Or as we go into the grade level course, do the get ready for grade level course in parallel or do it over breaks or do it over the summer. Yes, we are seeing uh, not only people do that, but we're actually seeing really, really strong gains when people are able to do that. You know, before COVID interrupted, we haven't published some of these. I mean, in general, we're seeing if students are able to do this even 45 minutes a week, they're growing, depending on the study, there's been over 52 efficacy studies on Khan Academy, they're growing 10 to 30% faster than expected. That's 45 minutes a week out of arguably eight or nine hours a week of, of math work that, that most kids do uh, between mm-hmm. classwork and, and homework. Um, and then we've, we have recent studies where we're seeing that in, in kind of these formal uh, district partnerships as well. Uh, but the other, the problem is, is that we're still not seeing the levels of adoption that we would like. Uh, you know, we would like all 50 million kids in, in America and then eventually, you know, the many hundreds of millions of kids in the world be able to work in this way. And I think the work there is just being able to better support teachers with better training, with better support, uh, make almost giving them permission to do it. Every teacher you talk to, they know when the 30 kids come into their classroom, they're all over the place. Mm-hmm. And there's well documented the average teacher has to teach to the 22nd percentile because they don't want to let too many kids kind of fall by the wayside. But even then, if you're teaching to the 22nd, 21% are still lost and 78% are still probably bored. And so tools right. like Khan Academy allow the teachers to start to better cater to those needs. And you know what we're trying to do to, to get more mainstream adoption for teachers is 
you know, they can use Khan Academy as just their daily practice for assignments. And just that has a benefit, saves teachers time, kids get as much practice and feedback as they need, but it's happening within a mastery framework so that the kids can keep going if they need, they can fill their prerequisites, teachers get data to realize, okay, maybe some of my kids need to back up a little bit, or maybe some of them are ready to move ahead. Uh, so that's our hope. You know, it's not going to be solved overnight, but you know, we, we are seeing more traction than I think many of us would have expected. There's about, you know, now with COVID, we're seeing about 30 million students a month come to Khan Academy. About 3 million of those are hitting are hitting thresholds, especially in classrooms that are associated with some of these large efficacy gains. Uh, so it's already, you know, we're making a dent, uh, but we still have a lot of work to do to, to make, to, to get all 50 million kids in America at that level. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you mentioned COVID because that was my next question to you. Uh, talk to us about your, uh, your COVID bump. It must have been astronomical and I'd love to hear from you, uh, not only how as, a, as an organization, uh, you, you've had to step up really, uh, given that everybody was looking to Khan Academy to fill gaps and everything else, but also um, what you learned and what concerns you about, uh, about the way people are approaching online learning in light of COVID. Yeah, obviously there's a very, very relevant question right now. Um, so, you know, just our, our journey with COVID, is way, it was actually way back in February that we first started seeing spikes of usage of Khan Academy in Asia. And we're like, oh, why is this happening? <laughs> it was kind of, and then, and then we got a letter from a teacher in South Korea. This was the first time that I grokked what was going on, where the teacher said that, that he was using Khan Academy with his students to, to, as the country had shut down their schools. And I was like, wow, a whole country shutting down its schools because of a virus? And then yeah. obviously two weeks later, you start, you know, you start hearing murmurs in the US that, hey, we might have to do this. And that's when we started kind of setting up a war room where, you know, one, we stress tested our servers. We said, we're going to have to do better webinars for parents and teachers to understand how to use us in this world. Uh, we, we started, uh, you know, putting out lesson plans because at the end of the day, we realized that this was going to be, people are going to turn to us. You know, we could have never foreseen this situation, but we cover multiple subjects and grades where as accessible as it gets, obviously we're free, but we're also available on mobile devices. We're available in multiple languages. Uh, we cover sub many subjects and grades. We have, you know, we can work in a classroom setting and have teacher tools, but we also work in kind of a direct to student or family setting as well. And then that first week, I think it was the second or third week of March. Yeah, our traffic by the end of that week was approaching about, you know, 250 to 300% of normal registrations were, you know, parent registrations were 20 times normal. Uh, you know, normal school days, we were seeing about 30 million learning minutes a day. Um, in the spring, we were seeing close to 85, 90 million learning minutes a day. And so we've just been trying to keep up with that. And, you know, over the summer, we that's when we launched the Get Ready for Grade Level courses. Um, and and once again, just trying to support, especially teachers and, and parents as much as possible. In, in terms of COVID itself, you know, I, I like to be very clear because I'm sometimes viewed as like the poster child for online learning. It is this is very suboptimal. This is not good. Like distance yeah. learning has its values, uh, but this for the great majority of kids, this is going to be a very, very, very tough year. Uh, and in my lens, you know, it's never technology for technology's sake. It should always be technology in service to some more aspirational, true pedagogical goal. Now, COVID has dealt us the hand that we have. You know, the fears here are, a lot of kids, you know, 30, 40% in a lot of urban school districts don't have sufficient internet access or device access at home. We've seen heroic efforts, seriously heroic efforts on, on the part of, you know, large public school districts to get out 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 laptops, partner with the telecom carriers. Uh, but even then, 10, 15% of the kids aren't engaged. Maybe they don't have the supports at home. Maybe multiple people in a house are sharing a device. Uh, and so there's a very big fear that you're going to have a lot of divergence this coming year. Uh, you know, a lot of kids are going to stay engaged. Uh, you know, I'm not worried about my own children. They have, you know, their teachers have been engaged. It's a tech savvy school. We, um, we're lucky to have a house where we're able to support our kids and that we have devices, et cetera. But there's a lot of other kids, probably five, 10, 15% who are probably already, you know, the kids that were falling behind, they might not only not learn for six months, nine months, 12 months, they'll atrophy the skills they do have. And they might even just lose the patterns of, of school and, and the, the, the structure of it. So that actually makes me very, very worried. Now there's good efforts that we're seeing around the country of, you know, places like Maryland, where they're, 
they're doing distance learning, but they're opening up the schools for those kids to come. So they can have internet access, they can have meals, uh, right. they have they hire people. The teachers are still teaching from home, but they hire adults who in a COVID safe way can just make sure that the kids are on task. You know, that's things that you and I are doing with our kids at home. So that's a good model we're seeing in Phoenix. They're calling every student every day, just have a conversation, a check-in with them. So that's what I worry about. Now, you know, there, there's there are opportunities uh, silver lining, people are taking the digital divide more seriously than ever. You have a whole generation of teachers who've been kind of thrown into the deep end of the pool on technology, and it's uncomfortable and it's painful and suboptimal in the short term. But in the long term, it will increase comfort of using these tools w- w- when appropriate. You have parents more engaged than ever in their kids' education for the most part. Uh, and you have kids where they're, they're having to ex- exercise more agency and independence for the most part. So the kids who are able to do it, I actually think that's, that could be a, a healthy thing for them. But, it, for, but for everyone, just not having the socialization, not being able to you know, have, have that connection to friends and, and peers in the same way, I think is, is, is really tough for, for a lot of kids right now. Yeah, what do you say, or I'm curious if you've had uh, parents uh, reach out to Khan Academy and, and say, you know what, I'm not going to send my kid to school. I'm just going to use the Khan Academy curriculum for sixth grade. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a cluster in my school and I don't want to deal. And so uh, it seems to me that the platform, although uh, extraordinarily comprehensive, uh, wasn't really in, wasn't envisioned for that. Right. It wasn't it wasn't necessarily a homeschooling platform uh, for some of the reasons you noted. What um, how have you been able to kind of bridge that gap and, and communicate to families, um, you know, from an institutional perspective that, uh, you know, optimally a teacher is um, is is critical, if that's what you believe. Yeah, yeah, I'll be the first to say also, and I would say this for my own kids and by extension, everyone's kids, if I had to pick between an incredible teacher and incredible technology, yeah. I would pick the incredible teacher every time. Now, right. luckily, we don't have to make that trade off. You can have incredible technology in service to an incredible teacher. And once again, it should never be technology for technology's sake. It's what's our goal? Okay, our goal is mastery learning, personalization, arming the teacher with better information, facilitating peer to peer uh, types of interactions. Now, you know, for that hypothetical example of a family that that wants to homeschool, you know, I think for, for some families, homeschooling is a fine option. Even if Khan Academy didn't exist, if the parents are really invested in it or they, they can hire, uh, you know, tutors or whatever else, it might be right for, for that family. And we do know that a large fraction of homeschoolers are using Khan Academy uh, pre-COVID uh, for, for what they need. And, you know, obviously a homeschooling parent has to think about a lot of things beyond the academic standards. To your point, you know, Khan Academy is very comprehensive. It does cover all of the major standards, especially in math. We're doing a deep dive in, in, in science as we speak right now. And over time, we want to cover all academic subjects from pre-K to the core of college. Uh, but especially already in math and high school science, you can lean very, very heavily on Khan Academy. But if you are, I would still make sure that your, your children have an opportunity to you know, on the science side do labs, um, on the math side to do collaborative problem solving with other kids or with an adult or with you if you're if you're the parent. So, the, you know there is a movement with COVID where parents are setting up pods and and whatever else. And I think there's ways you can do that quite effectively. And kids are getting socialization, and we hope that Khan Academy and we do see that Khan Academy is very valuable for them. But for most kids, their classroom having that teacher is really going to be uh, essential. Uh, for them. And that's why we, we put so much resources into supporting teachers as well as we can uh, so that they can reach every kid where they are. Yeah, can you talk about what, um, what those resources look like for underprivileged schools where uh, now, not, you know, not only do they have the, the, the issues that they were facing prior to COVID, but now, you know, now there's a uh, arguably an increased risk of, um, of contagion because of the structures of the buildings and because of the, you know, the dynamics of, of how people live and transportation and everything else, uh, you know, on top of decreased resources and a, you know, uh, just a really, really challenging time. Uh, I, I think many people are, are just very concerned that um, an online solution just can't be implemented in that scenario because you're really just sort of in survival mode. What um, over and above the platform, uh, you know, education on the platform and and everything else for people who are are, are motivated and knowledgeable enough to to take advantage of your product. What else do you think? 
we need in order to help bridge the educational inequity divide in this country? Yeah, I think that's the ultimate question. You know, I think there's multiple layers to it. The first layer is the digital divide. If that doesn't get addressed, you know, that's kind of basal right. infrastructure for Khan Academy to do its work. I mean, there's non-for-profits in other countries that are doing offline versions of Khan Academy, but the, the best experience is by on, on true online and 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 you know, not just for Khan Academy, frankly, just participating in the economy these days, you should have mm -hmm. internet access. So that's step one. Now in the US, we're seeing signs, and once again, that could be this one of the silver linings of COVID that people close the digital divide at home. So let's, you know, fingers crossed uh, uh, that that happens. I think the layer after that, you know, there's just a lot of awareness and support and training that we need to do for uh, teachers, for school districts, for parents to know that this resource is there. Uh, you know, the unfortunate thing is we don't have, you know, I, I, I still meet low income families. Uh, they, they might have even heard of Khan Academy, but they assume it's some type of for-profit that you have to pay $10 a month for. And I'm like, no, it's free. And by the way, here's the efficacy studies. It's far better than those people who are happy to charge you 10, 20, $30 a month for, you know, some type of uh, for-profit tool. And they're, they're almost suspicious of <laughs> like, there, right. must, be a, there, there, there exactly. must be a catch. I'm like, no, look at the efficacy studies. And if you can get your child to work on this for 30 minutes a day, you know, a couple of, you know, four or five days a week, I'm confident that not only your child to do all right in math, they're going to thrive. And then also in the sciences, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we have to, we have to get through on, on that level. And then I think there's another layer, which, and actually I would have, I would say this irrespective of Khan Academy, it goes back to the fact that 70% of kids have to take remediation in usually math. And you have similar proportions in reading comprehension, which to me signals that in a, especially in under-resourced areas, we go through the motions of school. You know, we're, we're, we have these kids sit in seventh grade math, eighth grade math, algebra, geometry, trig, and then they go to community college or college and four-year colleges, we're seeing 25% are being told, you're not even ready to learn algebra. And yeah. college algebra is kind of algebra too. It's kind of ninth or 10th grade algebra. And so it's clearly, you're just going through the motions, but because of these gaps accumulating, they're not really able to engage. And you're seeing the same thing in reading comprehension, that because kids' reading and writing skills aren't at par, they just kind of go through the motions of the higher level courses. And then they have to get remediation. To some degree, mastery learning is first enforced really late where it can be very demoralizing in, in, in college. So I actually think even pre-COVID, I, I think less is more that math reading comprehension and writing, you know, it's very traditional point of view, the three R's, although it's really two R's in an A, I always yeah. have to say, <laughs> yeah. arithmetic, we don't talk like school, yes. but, the, um, uh, but it really is those three things. We have to make sure kids really, really have mastery in those things. Uh, yeah. And so, especially in COVID when everyone is already stressed out, I've been advocating that less is more. I think a lot of teachers right now, especially this back to school, have felt pressure to completely transplant their eight hours of school into the virtual. That's a lot of stress on the school and the teachers. It's a lot of stress on the students and it's a lot of stress on parents to think about how, especially for younger kids, to be able to submit the, the, the things and keep them on video conference for whatever, three, four, five hours a day. Uh, what I think is a really good conversation of like, let's just, especially during COVID, make sure that the core is happening, that the kids are getting the core skills in math, the core skills in reading comprehension, and the score core skills in writing, and they have room to breathe, they have room to, to socialize, and, and because there's just anxiety in the air right now. Yeah. And, 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 and people just have to have a conversation about that. But I think if, I think there's models where you can have two hours a day of deep reading math, reading comprehension, using free tools, using Khan Academy, reading magazine articles, journaling, where your kids are going to be just fine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to turn to audience questions now. I apologize in advance uh, to those of you who submitted a question uh, and if I don't have a chance to, to ask it. Uh, but I'll just go through, I'll throw out some questions at you, Sal, and, um, and we'll see how many we can get through. Well, Sam is asking, what in your opinion will be the long-term impact on the students who don't have the technological resources and will be left behind due to remote learning in this COVID environment? So I think if we just, you know, return back to school and pretend like nothing happened, which we shouldn't do, but if we did do that, then yeah, I think you're going to have, you know, these numbers of the numbers of kids needing remediation, dropouts, it's just going to go through the roof. Um, you're going to see a whole generation, probably 20, 30% of kids who are going to be disproportionately already underrepresented kids that are just going to disappear or, or, or disengage from the system, which will be a disaster. Mm -hmm. 
and, and you're going to see it affected in economic outcomes and in other, I mean, it's going to, it's not a good situation. And so I hope that over the course of the next year, I hope it's a national or at least a statewide policies where we have mechanisms for remediation, for filling in gaps that we, we call it out, that it's not like, you just don't go through the motions. Cause actually that was all, always a problem. You know, I used to write kind of these fundraising proposals describing this as a slow motion catastrophe. This was before COVID where the number of kids who need remediation, now it's not even a slow motion catastrophe. It's a kind of a fast catastrophe happening yeah. before our eyes. And so uh, I, I think this is a moment where, you know, whoever the next administration is needs to, needs to do like a, a, a mate, like, you know, treat it like a, a major national emergency. And, you know, there's obviously multiple national emergencies happening simultaneously around healthcare, around the economy, but one of them is education. I would argue those are the three and, and do a full court press, make sure that there's resources for kids to, to remediate, fill in their gaps and learn at their own pace, prove what they know in case they fail classes and things like that. So that they later can get the credit without having a stigma the rest of their life. Uh, this is obviously things that we're working on here at Khan Academy uh, and, you know, we're, we're happy to have conversations with, with anyone who wants to have them um, because, yeah, if we don't, it's, it's, it's going to be pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, Tavish is asking, uh, do you worry about too much screen time? Yeah, I, I worry a lot about, especially now, you know, if we were talking a year ago, too much screen time, people were thinking like an hour is too much screen time. Yeah, right. And, and then now people are like, is it okay my kid's on the screen for like eight hours? And I'm like, no, I, I, I think that's unhealthy for me, you know. Oh, yeah. I, I spend actually a lot of my meetings now. I turn off the screen. I put on my my earbuds and I go for a walk uh, and I'm still engaged, but I'm able to walk through my neighborhood and and and. And, and, and enjoy some fresh air and get some exercise. Uh, and I think that's even more important for young kids. So the way, I, this, this is another reason why, you know, to what I was saying a couple of minutes ago, less is more right now. If a student is able to put in say 20 or 30 minutes a day on say Khan Academy on math to get that practice at their zone of proximal development on their learning edge, they're going to do just fine. They'll actually, there's actually some evidence they might even accelerate what they would have nor learned otherwise. If they're able to do 30 minutes a day of reading, you know, real reading, and if they're able to have a conversation with their teachers and their parents over lunch or something, even better. If they're able to do a little journaling every day, maybe do one writing, do a blog post that they can share with friends and family once a week. If they do those three things, they're going to be fine. And the total amount of screen time you need to do those three things every day is sub two hours. And so I would say everything else is extra. And so, and it is good to do the other things, but even there, you shouldn't do it extended periods of time. You know, what we're advocating with teachers is instead of uh, an hour with 30 kids, do six 10 minute sessions with five kids each. Then it's less screen time, but when you're on the screen, it's more attention. Or if you're going to do a 30 minute session or an hour session, break it up, say, okay, here's something to do now, leave the screen, go do it and come back to the screen after 20 minutes so that you have your break. And I think that's how we can balance the tension where right now the screen is our only connection to the, the outside world, uh, but not only being on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, have you encountered the issue of, um, I mean, there are some kids, there's some adults who just can't handle a screen. I just, you know, can't focus on Zoom and, uh, you know, especially younger kids. I mean, it's a, it's a tall order. It's hard to, um, you know, to ask a kid to sit still for a long time. Oh, it's incredible. I'm, I'm, I think I'm one of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, I've, I've told very openly to my team members, and I mean, I, and I say this, like, you know, in some of the, my long meetings, I'm, I'm doing yoga, uh, and, you know, not out of disrespect for the other people. I say I listen better if I'm doing, if I'm in downward dog listening to you. Right. Uh, because I'm, my blood is flowing, I'm stretching, I'm breathing deep versus if I'm just on Zoom, I, you know, I just get my, I get like right. my, my vision gets messed up. I lose focus. I get distracted. So, yeah, I think, I think, you know, unfortunately this massive experiment has been thrown on the world. Uh, but I think people are starting to get creative of, okay, how do we get the benefits of distance learning and being on video conference, but not, not doing it just for the sake of doing it, not just showing FaceTime, but having outlets where we can, yeah, get our blood flowing, walk around and not be on the screen when it's not necessary. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. Eric asks, um, Eric says, I recently read your book and came away amazed but daunted at the inertia of the status quo across the many segments of education. Well, how do you integrate the focus solution of Khan Academy to revolutionize the approach of in-person education? and long-term proficiency over standardized testing. As yeah, you know, this is what I'm, 
I, I hope to devote my, I am devoting my life to, um, and I don't think it's going to be solved overnight, but I do think we're making a lot of progress on this front. You know, I tell, I tell the team at Khan Academy, we're in phase three of the organization, phase one, when it was me in a walk-in closet, it's actually this walk-in closet. So it's like everything's come full circle again. I'm glad we brought the closet into the discussion. This was very important. This is the legendary closet where the magic happened. That's right. And no one should feel too. It's a nice walk-in closet. It's yeah, it is I mean, a closet. There's but a, I have a window. I don't know any other closets that have a bookshelf. Oh, it's very nice. Yeah. So no one should feel sympathy. Uh, but uh, the, the it's my favorite place to work, actually. Um, but, you know, what I tell people, phase one of Khan Academy was that period where I was tutoring cousins and I was, you know, I'd quit my job and I was working in this closet. Phase two was the last 10 years, roughly, when we've scaled and we've shown that we can scale to, to tens of millions or hundreds of millions of folks. But phase three is when we really have to move the dial for countries. Um, and if we don't, we're not really delivering on our on our mission, but I, we're, we're, we're making those dents. We're seeing the efficacy studies. We're working with large districts. Uh, we're working with ministries of education in some cases. So I'm, I am feeling hopeful. On top of that, we're looking at ways to really tackle the whole issue. Uh, you know, above and beyond the really important innovations that Khan Academy is doing on bringing more content out there, making the site more engaging. We're also looking at ways to do certification, ways to do tutoring, which I've used part of this broader mission. Uh, you know, there's this effort actually just got announced today, um, a separate effort I'm doing, uh, which is very complementary to Khan Academy. I hope they actually converge eventually called schoolhouse.world, which is a way to pair students who need tutoring into group tutoring sessions with people, vetted people who run them. And it also does certification where you submit a video of yourself finishing a test on Khan Academy while talking it out loud and you get certified that yes, you know that material. And University of Chicago just announced today that they're going to be using that as part of their admission cycle. Uh, they're viewing that as you know comparable to other forms of standardized assessment uh, so that so that people can prove their knowledge to the world. And all of this stuff starts to flow together because you know it's one thing to make stuff that where people can learn at their own time and pace and the tools, but then to also connect them so that they, those outcomes on those tools matter. They're not just practices for other things that the work on Khan Academy itself can lead to opportunity. That's the type of thing that I hope over time is, is going to get more and more people on, onto the platform and, and to benefit from the learning, whether it's on Khan Academy and learning at their own time and pace or, or the schoolhouse and being able to get the live tutoring. Mm -hmm. Anjali asks a very good question uh, about writing. So uh, most of most studies, um, to the extent that some of the stuff has been studied, uh, indicate that there is a path to success for math. Math is more, you know, pun intended, linear. Um, writing is very different, and uh, reading comprehension to some degree is also. So language is is different. Can you talk about how you are addressing uh, that? achievement gap and um, where's the innovation there and what can we do? Yeah, and, and it is, you're right. In some ways, even though math is a major issue, uh, but I think there's actually a, a clearer path actually to fixing it. I, I'm a strong believer that the mastery learning, the personalization, and we're seeing it in efficacy study after efficacy study. You're absolutely right. You know, something like reading comprehension, not only is it, you know, whatever your reading level is, your lexile level, but there's also this notion of background knowledge. Like if you actually have background knowledge in a domain, even if the lexile level is harder than your reading level, you're more likely to understand it and vice versa. If Even if it's written at a quite easy reading level, but you have no context, it's very hard to understand uh, what's going on. So, you know, we've taken early forays into English language arts, uh, reading comprehension, grammar. We're the official practice for the SAT. So there we have, and we have some efficacy studies, although right now it, to your point, we're seeing larger gains on the math side than we're, we're seeing gains in both, but it's larger on the math side. In Khan Academy Kids, which is our early learning app, that's reading, writing, social, emotional learning, and math for ages three to seven. It goes, well, it goes through first grade standards now. It's going to go through second grade standards next year. We're also seeing very promising gains as well. And we've also taken some forays into English and language arts, reading comprehension, and grammar on, you know, essentially you could say grades three through eight between Khan Academy Kids and, and the SAT. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the real issue is we have a lot more work to make our mastery system really work for those uh, those things, because, you know, in math, every you every every standard almost is a, is a discrete skill and they do build on each other, while in in reading. 
it's really the same, it's a smaller set of skills that you keep repeating over and over again in more and more complex texts and in different contexts. And so we have some engineering work to do probably over the next five years, if we can find the resources to build out our platform so it does a much better job there. But there's other, you know, I would say low tech ways, uh, you know, when, as I was talking earlier and during COVID, if they're young kids, read to your kids, use Khan Academy kids, older kids, just read magazine articles, talk, them, talk about it. You can't underestimate just the value of just doing a lot of reading and talking about it. Not, you know, don't do it in a vacuum and just doing a lot of writing, but making the writing matter. So someone's reading it, someone's giving you feedback. Uh, every person who's a great reader, every person who's great at reading comprehension or ever a great writer, it was practice, practice, practice with a lot of feedback and discussion. Right. And it's absolutely a challenge. I mean, and it's a challenge that, uh, you know, it's a live challenge, not just for online learning, of course, but, you know, in every school, because any, you know, any uh, strategy that is seeking to close the achievement gap uh, faces this issue. And, and, and honestly, nobody's, you know, nobody's found a magic bullet yet. So I'm, I'm happy to know that you all are uh, taking an engineering approach to, uh, you know, to try to come up with some sort of, you know, more disciplined solution. Uh, Elena asks uh, about uh, Khan Academy's, uh, the, the availability of Khan Academy's uh, courses in other languages. Can you talk about uh, what the plan is for translating the lessons yeah, you know, this has always been our dream, um, our mission statement, free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Uh, so what we do is we've made our platform so it is localizable for the most part. There's 46 translation projects around the world at different levels of fidelity. So there's a there's a Khan Academy Azerbaijan, there's a Khan Academy Turkey, there's a Khan Academy uh, French, there's a, you know, there's a, a Swahili Khan Academy. Um but they're all at different levels. The ones that are most built out, es.conacademy.org, that's the Spanish version of Khan Academy, br.conacademy.org, Brazilian Portuguese. And not only are they localized, but we have teams, and some of these are volunteer teams who are doing it independent of us, independent nonprofits, who are also mapping to the standards. But the ones where we're deepest is in Spanish, Brazilian, Portuguese, and then we have a team in India uh, that is doing uh, the major languages in India, including English, which is a combination of, of, of Hindi and English. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jennifer asks, how do you see virtual education transforming our expectations of K-12 public education in the next five years? Well, I think, um, you know, it's it's been pretty static for the past, I would argue, 200 years in a lot of ways. Like a lot of the things we've been talking about have been in place for a while. I do think over the next five years, we're going to see alternative pathways that are more personalizable and that are also, I guess you could describe as competency-based. The system that we're in today is, for lack of a word, seat time-based. Uh, your Carnegie units in high school are based on, did you take N years of math, N years of English? Even at college, your credits are actually given in hours. You have three credit hours. That's how much time you, in theory, would have spent uh, per week on, on those courses. We argue, and this is in line with mastery learning, it should be outcome-based. Did you learn the material or you didn't? For some people, it might take two weeks to learn the material. For some folks, it might take two years. It's okay. No judgment on the person who takes more time. And if you haven't learned the material yet, you shouldn't just get a C and move on. Keep working on it so that you really learn the material. And so, you know, we are working on competency-based mechanisms. And this partnership with the University of Chicago is a good example of that. You show mastery on Khan Academy at any age, doesn't matter how long it took you, University of Chicago is going to say, okay, you know your statistics, you know your calculus, you're ready for work in a rigorous environment like, like University of Chicago. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Well, we are unfortunately just about out of time. I want to thank you so much, Sal, for spending uh, this time with us. It's been, a, it's been an enlightening conversation. I, it's so inspiring to, um, to talk to you. I personally am so grateful for what you do for the world and for our country and for kids. Um, you're really an inspiration to all of us. So thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Asia Society Texas Center offers over 150 public programs each year featuring arts, culture, education, business, policy, and current events. Uh, many of these programs are free and made possible by the strong financial support of members and friends. As um, we hope we, you'll consider adding your support tonight, you can text Asia Society TX to 243-725 to donate. Uh, we really appreciate your consideration. And I hope that you all tune in again next Thursday, October 8th at 6.30. Uh, Central 
for the Women's Leadership Series on the topic of building Black and Asian solidarity, women leading across race, history, and culture. We'll have Dr. Ruth Simmons, president of Prairie View a and University, and Helen Zia, who's an activist, an author, and a journalist. The conversation will be moderated by Emmy Award-winning co-anchor of ABC News Nightline, Juju Chang. She'll be much better than I will, so please do tune in. Uh, hope you learn about upcoming webcasts through the Asia Society website. So thank you so much. We'll sign off now. Uh, Sal, again, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. I hope everybody has a wonderful night and um, onward, all of us. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. And I, I know Juju, and I think you, you've given her a good run for her money. Oh, thanks. Take care. Good to see you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.